Good morning, Wellspring Bible Fellowship. It's so good to see you folks here this morning. Let's stand up this morning as we uh, turn our focus upward to the Lord. Let's stand up. I want to read out a psalm, Psalm 5. Let's just turn our focus upward. It says, because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. Lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. For you bless the godly, O Lord. You surround them with your shield of love. Let's worship our God this morning. come into this place today just lifting up our praise to you. God, may, uh, may the songs and the words, may our thoughts being lifted up be out of hearts that are uh, loving you, God, out of hearts that recognize you as our Lord and Savior and Master. God, may we bow humbly before you today. May we recognize your Lordship over this place and over our lives, even as we sing and open up your word and fellowship with each other, God. May you be over all. May we exalt you in this place today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen, amen. We are so glad to see you here today. I hope that you feel at home already. And uh, just take a moment and love on each other today. It's so good to see you. Thanks for being here. As we continue just uh, in that same vein of just worshiping our God today, and why don't you just close your eyes and, uh, and just think of two things 
that you can praise God for today. Just think of two things that you can just praise him and thank him for this morning.
Sing it out. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Lord, today we lift you up. Uh, you are the only king forever. God, the one who was and is and is to come. God, you're the one who spoke through your son, Jesus Christ, everything into existence. We are here today just to recognize your proper place on the throne of, of kingdom, uh, of heaven's throne today, Lord. And we just look to you. We gaze upon you. God, we... we Bring our perspective from this world, from our life, everything that we have been uh, seeing and doing at, through this week, Lord. We come and bring that perspective to the proper perspective of who you are. God, everything, everyone bows at your feet and recognizes your greatness. God, as we come today, uh, may we adjust our, uh, our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations in this life all to align with your will, God. We desire to see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. So strengthen your church today, even as we sing, even as we worship you and we speak and sing these truths, God. May our hearts be transformed to the likeness of your son Christ, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
just our words, but in our lives. God, may you be glorified in the way we live out all that you teach us. And Lord, open our eyes uh, in ways that maybe we are deceiving ourselves uh, in believing that we are living this out, God. But, but just show us. We, we desire that. Speak the word, God, and we just want to agree with you. Lord, we love you today, and we just give our praise and adoration to you. If you know this song, sing it out. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. You're my rock. You're my rock. You're my fortress. You're my deliverer in you. Will I trust? Praise the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen. You can be seated. She was coming here and she was going through a horrible divorce. And she would tell me the only thing that's making her go through this was Christ. I think it was the peace. Knowing what she was going through, knowing that the horrible you know, divorce she's going through to a man that she'd been married to for so long and loved and trusted, that that to fall apart and her still believing in God. I mean, that she still had that faith and that peace in her in her just her everyday walk, talk, she had that total peace. And I'm thinking, wow, that's what I want is that peace. And her to say, I, I, you know, even if this marriage fails, I still have Christ. I'm still part of that. And, and he's the one that's important. But to, to see her and her to really walk the walk and, you know, and, and, and be mentors to other people 
Here she's going through the crisis, but she's still mentoring and talking about, about God to other people. And you're going, wow. So it impressed me. She was just always there for me. She just would be, she would listen, I think is the, the most important thing. And, and she would tell me a scripture she might've read that day that she said, oh, here, read, you know, read this, or, or here's a book that I think would really help you for where you're at. She goes, I just read it and it really helped me. Those kind of things, you know. And I can't remember, there was a little book that she gave me and, and I thought, oh, you know, it just gave you that peace and knowing you were on, you were on the right path. But God gave me that. He, he, soon as I stopped living about me, saying, what will please me? And I said, God, what will please you? Everything changed. My whole feeling about the world itself and, and who do I need to please and who do I need, you know, to do any of that. It just all went away. She didn't say how to do it. She didn't say, oh yeah, you got to do this, 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 and this. She says, well, here, this is kind of what helped me. She let me find my own path. She gave me some direction, but she said, this helped me, but it might not help you, you know, because we're in two kind, kind of the same situation, but not. And she just said, well, you know, try this. It might help you. So she didn't, wasn't pushy, you know, not trying to say, yep, you got to follow God and you got to do this because if you don't do that, you're never going to be happy. Like, where I work, I talk probably talk about God all the time, and the girls are probably getting tired of me, but they always come to me. They know that that I totally, you know, believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins, and and if they have problems, they'll come into my office, and they will say, "Hey, Robin, can you pray for me today?" And I went, you bet. You want to pray right now? You know, most people are never going to hear your testimony. No, most people are never going to hear you say, "Oh, you're." you're a believer of Jesus Christ, they're not gonna always hear you because they're not maybe in your inner circle. But your walk will tell everything about you that no matter what your day is, no matter you know how bad the world's going, you have Jesus Christ there with you, you're okay. So I, I just look at it as that is the most important thing is for people to see. Maybe not what I say, but what they see. Well, good morning. Well, thank the Lord for, for people like Robin Zwicker in our, in our midst and, and people who built into her and, and others. Um, what a blessing it is to hear those, those testimonies and those stories. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rob Johnson. Um, I'm actually the youth pastor here at Wellspring. And um, George, I don't know, you're back there. I, I appreciate what you were saying this morning about the behind the scenes people. It just reminded me of um, somebody who discipled me when I was young, my youth pastor. Um, we, used to, we used to get together during the week and we would um, go through some of the, the worship rehearsal stuff that we were gonna be doing. And I remember specifically one time, I was probably eighth grade, maybe a freshman in high school, and we were setting up the chairs in the youth room and he was teaching me about magic ministry. And magic ministry is this thing where you show up to church and, and the chairs are organized and neat and the, the bathrooms are clean and you know the, everything is ready to go, the sound system is up and running. And, and of course, then he goes, and you know that magic ministry doesn't exist, right? <laughs> that, that all of those things are done by people. And so um, I just want to just want to reiterate that. Thank you to all of you guys who who are working behind the scenes so diligently that every Sunday we show up and magically things are ready to go. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, amen. <clears throat> well, I am thankful for the spiritual example of my parents. In particular, I can remember as a young preteen engaging in a weekly battle with my dad over going to church on Sunday morning. Because at that time in my life, going to church meant that I had to get up on a non-school day early 
It meant that I had to, to dress uncomfortably, and it meant that I had to sit through a boring sermon. So I wasn't a huge fan of that, but I am thankful for my dad's resolve in the battle. Going to church was a non-negotiable for him. And I, I've never actually asked him this question, but I would say that my attendance in a local worship service on Sunday was as important to him as my attendance at school during the week. Eventually, I realized that this was a battle I wouldn't win, so I stopped fighting. But then something strange happened. Somewhere in my junior high years, I actually started enjoying going to church. And I'm not just talking about the, the midweek youth group meeting. I enjoyed doing that, but I also enjoyed going to the, the Sunday service. I can clearly remember looking forward to, to, to going there on Sunday mornings to be with, with my community. This was where, that's where my community was. This is where my family was. And especially as I moved into my high school years, the church was where all of my friends were. And I'm not just talking about peers either. I, had, I enjoyed relationship with people of all ages and all stages. Uh, I learned as a young person how to have an adult conversation with other adults. People expressed genuine interest and care for the things happening in my life. In fact, as I consider the spiritual history of my life, I believe that the church has played a major role. And I would even go so far as to say that during every period of my life that I experienced large amounts of growth spiritually, it was as a direct result of the ministry of a local church. And even having spent five years at Bible college, most people only spend four there, but I spent five Earning a degree in Bible and theology, I would say that my time spent in the church was more valuable to my spiritual journey uh, than my formal Bible education. Don't get me wrong, um, there was a lot that happened there, there was a lot of good things, but, but it pales in comparison to the growth that I've experienced as being a part of the church of Jesus Christ. And I realize even now as I'm speaking these words, that there are those in this room and maybe watching online who've had a much different experience of church. You've been hurt. You've been rejected. In the very place where you thought you should find security and safety, you found only pain and sorrow. And for that, I am deeply sorry. I too have experienced hurt at the hands of a church. But I don't wanna be vague about this. When I say church, I don't mean a building or an event. I mean people. And, and sometimes those people that bear the name church and who can have such a profound impact on our lives also could have a negative impact. And while my life has been greatly enriched by those people, I have also received deep wounds from people who bear the name church. But that's because all people are flawed. We're all sinners. And after all, isn't that what the church is? I mean, to be a Christian isn't one of, the, one of the things that you have to recognize is the fact that you're a sinner. And so the church is, it's a concentration of sinners. <laughs> but we're a concentration of sinners who have been forgiven and who are called to forgive and who are commissioned to represent the living God to the rest of the world. Listen to 2 Corinthians five seventeen through 21. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
He's speaking of the church. That we are to be ambassadors for Christ. You see, even with all of her flaws, with all of her broken people, with all of her hypocrisies, with all of her imperfections, the church is still the bride of Christ. The church is still the agency through whom Jesus planned from eternity past to make his gospel known to the rest of the world. And it's my great privilege to share with you this week and next week about the church in our Multiply series. And I actually, I jumped at the chance to preach these two sermons because the church has been so instrumental in my life as a believer. And I also believe that God's calling on my life specifically is directly related to the church. A few years years ago, as I was thinking and praying through what I felt God's mission for my life specifically was, This is what I came up with. To equip the church of Jesus Christ to live out healthy, gospel-centered lives while carrying on the mission of Christ. I believe wholeheartedly that this is God's calling on my life. And it might look different at different stages of my life. Right now, it means that I'm equipping the younger generation of the church to live out healthy gospel-centered lives while carrying on the mission of Christ. But I believe that that this is something that God has called me to do for my entire life. So that's my life's mission statement. And it's my prayer that today's and next Sunday's sermon would accomplish those ends, as well as all that I say and do, both within and outside these walls. So here's the breakdown for the next two weeks. This week, we're talking about life in the church. What does it look like to be a part of the church? <clears throat> as, we, as we live out this calling that we have to be the body of Christ, how do we do that? How should we interact with one another? I would argue that we are living in redemptive community, or at least that we should be. Next week, we'll be discussing just one part of our local mission as the church. How should we interact with the community around us? What should the relationship between the church and non-believers look like? I would say that we are living in local mission. In the following week after that, Doug Hazen will be sharing the other part of the church's mission, which is global outreach. So as for me, the next two weeks, it's life inside the church, and it's the local mission of the church. And I hope to show today and next week that these two ideas are not separate from one another, but are actually closely tied together. And to the degree that a church is healthy in one area will be the the degree that it's healthy in another area. So first of all, for clarification's sake, I want to do some some defining. There's, There's two primary definitions or biblical understandings of what the church is. The first is what I and others call the Big C Church, or the Capital C Church. And that is, that is the universal church of Jesus Christ. Not the universalist church, very different. The universal church of Jesus Christ. When I say that, I'm referring to all believers everywhere during every time. That is the church of Jesus Christ. There has never been a true follower of Jesus who hasn't also been a part of the Big C Church. The other is the Small C Church. Small C. This would be the practical representation of the Big C Church. It's the gathering of the followers of Jesus, Big C Church, who live in the same general location and have purposed to follow Jesus together. This is a local church here at Wellspring Bible Fellowship. So this means carrying out the mission Jesus gave his followers and also just doing life together. Because as we see in scripture, the life of the believer was never meant to be lived alone. So I'm going to pray and then we'll get started this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you that you have made us a part of your church. Thank you that you paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could be saved but you didn't just leave us there, Lord. 
You adopted us into your family. You brought us into your church so that we could do life together, so that we could do mission together, so that we could spread the hope of the gospel together as your body. Lord, I pray this morning that you would um, correct any misunderstandings that we might have as to what your church is and to how we should live life together. Lord, I pray that you would that you would speak clearly um, in spite of my um, unclear ramblings, that you would, that you would be um, most highly glorified. Thank you for everything that you are and everything that you do. In your name we pray, amen. So if you could turn with me to the book of Acts in your Bibles, we're gonna take a look at the beginning of the church. Acts chapter two, Um, So the context of this story is on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were hiding in the upper room and uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them with power and they went out and they began preaching the gospel. Uh, They were speaking in languages that they never learned before and and many people heard the gospel and were saved. And we're going to pick the story up in verse 41 of chapter 2, chapter 2. And we're going to read 41 through 47. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who are being saved. Now, I know we're good Baptists here, and we love, we love logic, and we know that oftentimes emotion can be misleading. But when I read this passage, I have a welling up of emotions inside me. When I read this passage in Acts, I get excited. I get this feeling of longing, And I get a feeling of expectation and and maybe even a slight bit of sadness. I get excited because I see what life inside the church could be like. I start longing because this is the experience of church that I want to have. This is the experience of church that I want my wife and my kids to have. This is the experience of church that I want the youth group to have. This is the experience of church that I want you guys to have. I I start feeling this expectation because I believe that this is what God really wants for his church. If God created his church to encourage and uplift his people and to shine forth the light of his love into a dark world, and if his church was his first and only attempt at doing so, I would expect that God would want his church here at Wellspring Bible Fellowship to be experiencing the level of health and fruitfulness that the early church was. I feel sad when we, and by we I mean me, fail to live up to this standard. We don't share life together the way we ought to. We don't share the love of Jesus with an unbelieving world the way we ought to. The desire of my heart, and I think it's God's desire as well, is for Wellspring Bible Fellowship to become a church where the people of God can learn to know and be known by God, and where we can know and be known by God's people. 
And we're, we're so taken aback by the scandalous gospel of Jesus Christ that just like that juicy piece of small town gossip that's so good, even the men can't help but spread it around, that we would take that gospel and spread it around. After all, isn't that really the heart of discipleship anyways? Learning who God is and how much he loves you through intimate relationship with his people, and then taking that which he's done in our lives and spreading it to, to everyone around us? So instead of breaking this passage up this morning into multiple points and discussing each characteristic bit by bit, which, by the way, I love to do, um, I'm going to break it up into two major themes. The first is life within the church, and the second is the impact of the church. We'll discuss the first theme today, and the second theme we'll save for next week. So, life within the church. Living in redemptive community, what does that mean? A community that redeems while being redeemed. To redeem just means to buy back or to restore. So when I say we should be living in redemptive community, what I mean is a community of people who are striving through the power of God to be the community they were designed to be. So what does it look like? What is the ideal life within the church? As we examine our passage in Acts, what we do see uh, describes what life was like for the early church. There's a good list there. Together, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. They were devoted to prayer. As they were together and they saw God working in their midst, they all felt a sense of awe together. They shared all things in common. They shared their possessions with any who might have need. They were day by day with one mind gathering in the temple. And they were eating together from house to house with gladness and sincerity of heart. So it seems to me that at least these first four descriptions should be considered together simultaneously. They were, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. In the life of the church, all of these elements go together. You wouldn't see any one of these alone in a church that was truly healthy. They must all happen with a degree of dependence upon one another. And here's what I mean. True devotion to God's word, which in our passage would be the apostles' teaching, requires fellowship. Why? Because just as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Because Jesus promised that where two or three are gathered together in his name, he will be there with them. And there's this thing that happens as I wrestle with Scripture, I start becoming resistive. I want to resist what I'm reading and what I'm learning. It's it's really easy for me to, to read a passage of Scripture and to determine what somebody else needs to hear out of that. It's really easy for me to look at that and say, okay, this is perfect for teaching so and so. They need to hear this. This is really good for them. But when it comes to my own life, when it comes to the things that I need to hear, as I'm reading and I'm, as I'm wrestling with Scripture, I start squirming a little bit. I start getting distracted. All of a sudden, my ADD kicks in, and I'm like, "Huh, oh, okay, there's something else to do. But as we chew on the Word together, and as we toss it around, trying with sincerity of heart to understand, we hold one another to a higher standard. We need to gather around the word of God together. What about fellowship? At first glance, fellowship and the breaking of bread may seem synonymous. And indeed, within the Baptist tradition, they oftentimes are. But I would say in this context that they are distinct and yet mutually dependent. 
So what do we mean by the breaking of bread? What does is, what is the author in Acts mean by the breaking of bread? I think the idea of togetherness through joining together for a meal is certainly involved here, but I think it goes much deeper than that. Especially as we see the idea that they gathered together for meals, that came up in just, just a few verses later. So what does this mean? Well, I think the primary meaning here is the Lord's Supper. We call it communion. So what is the Lord's Supper? What is communion? It is a sharing in common the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ as our Savior. You see, the fellowship that the early church in Acts shared with one another was founded upon the gospel. It was because of what Jesus had done, having given himself over to the wrath of God on behalf of each of them, that they could share fellowship, true fellowship with one another. This was no mere affinity that we're talking about. It wasn't just that they shared a common interest with one another. It was that they shared a common identity through Jesus Christ and his gospel. And I think a, a devotion to prayer undergirded all of these elements. Prayer, I'm sure, for each other's well-being and various concerns. Far more than that, though, I imagine them together cultivating a relationship with the Heavenly Father. As they prayed, maybe they not only made their request known to God and experienced his transcending peace, but I imagine it also became a service of praise and worship for them. Hopefully many in this room have had the, the joy of having an experience where as you're praying together with other believers, all of a sudden you just can't help but be in awe of who God is. One of the, the sweeter memories for Amber and I in the last couple of years came in the midst of one of the most difficult tragedies that we've faced. Two years ago, this Thanksgiving, Amber's uncle was lost in a freak boating accident. We were unable to attend the funeral service, but Amber knew that many non-believing family members and other non-believers would be present. And so it was important to her that the entire event be covered in prayer. So on the Saturday that the service was held, we invited members of our small group and other friends to join us in order to pray for the salvation of loved ones. And we were blessed that so many people took time out of their weekend to do this with us. But not only that, but as we sat there in our living room and as we prayed for the salvation of those who don't yet know Jesus, we became so overwhelmed with the glory of God that, that we weren't just praying for salvation anymore. We were praising the God who saves. What a precious moment that was for Amber and I. And I hope for everyone there. Now, as for the rest of the description in Acts chapter 2 of what life in the early church was like, I want to read the verses. And I want you to imagine what it might have been like to be a part of this church. We're going to start in verse 43. You can follow along with me if you like, or if it helps, just close your eyes and listen. And just, just put yourself in their shoes. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Imagine. Imagine being a part of a church where everyone was known by someone. I mean, really known. Imagine sharing life through a common understanding of the gospel in such a way that you would not be afraid to be known. Imagine a church where you could share your struggles with sin and know that help, love, and grace would be offered and condemnation would be shunned. 
because those who have applied the gospel to their own lives first know that they're capable of the same sins. Imagine a place where trusting in the Lord and for his providence would be a tangible thing. Because if ever a need arose, the rest of the church would step up to meet that need. Imagine a church where you never had to struggle alone, whether it was with a leaky roof or a broken marriage. Here in Acts, we have a body of believers who are imperfect and yet are so radically transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that in their excitement, they can't wait to hear more about the gospel and to discuss it with one another. They desire to spend time with one another Because they understand the gospel and the fact that they all have equal value and dignity before the Lord, they deeply care for one another and make sure that no one's needs go unmet. So much so that they're willing to give up their very own possessions to make it happen. When the church of Jesus Christ begins to resemble these things, that's when she becomes the unstoppable force that God intended her to be. I just love the verse at the end of this passage that says, and the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. It was because of of what it looked like to be the church. People were looking at this and going, whoa, I want to be a part of that. Listen to this quote from Tim Chester and Steve Timmis in the book, Total Church. The church lies at the very center of the eternal purpose of God. It's not a divine afterthought. It's not an accident of history. On the contrary, the church is God's new community. For his purpose, conceived in a past eternity, being worked out in history, and to be perfected in a future eternity, is not just to save isolated individuals and so perpetuate our loneliness but rather to build his church that is to call out of the world a people for his own glory. Did you catch that? His purpose is not just to save isolated individuals and so perpetuate our loneliness, but it's to build his church and to call out of the world a people for his own glory. I could continue to dream for the rest of the day about the potential of the church. But let's not forget why we're here. The name of the series that we've been in for the last couple of weeks is Multiply. We've been called by God to make disciples who make disciples. It's the command of Jesus on the lives of his followers to take this radical work that he's done in our own lives and spread it around to the people around us. So how does all this discussion of the church fit in with the discussion of discipleship? Well, first of all, a disciple should have a good understanding of the church and what is the purpose of the church. Second, I would argue that much of what we have talked about this morning is, in fact, discipleship. One of the things that has been of major importance to me in interacting with teenagers over the years has been emphasizing the importance of the church in the life of a believer. In in different um, counseling that I have done, whether formally or informally, the subject of church involvement always comes up. I always try to make it a point to bring that up. And notice I didn't say church attendance. You can show up, you can sing a song or two, shake a few hands, listen to a sermon and leave, and it might do you some good, but until you immerse yourself in the life of the church, you will never experience the kind of growth as a follower of Jesus that you would otherwise. This is because when you do that, you are surrounded by other believers who are committed to growing in their walk with the Lord and who are committed to helping you grow in your walk with the Lord. If you were to ask me about the people in my life who discipled me, 
It would only take a moment to come up with five or six names. Rob Chadwick, my youth pastor, Tim McFarland, Jim Adams, Scott Tripp, V.O. Chappelle. These are just ordinary guys that took an interest in me, that, that took the time to get to know me. Police officers, roofers, teachers, World War II veteran, phone company technician. They're all men that had a tremendous impact on my life as a follower of Jesus Christ. And all men that I would never have known if my own dad didn't insist that I went to church on Sunday. You see, when you become a believer, you are automatically adopted into a family. A family that has been given gifts in order to help you grow as a believer. And at the same time, as a believer, you have been given gifts by God in order to help other believers grow. <clears throat> so when you withhold yourself from the life of the church, not only are you shortchanging yourself from the gifts that God has given the church in order to benefit you, but you're also shortchanging the church from the gifts that God has given you in order to benefit them. Living life as a follower of Jesus is difficult. That's why the New Testament authors relate the Christian life on more than one occasion to a battle. That's why Jesus himself says, in this world you will have trouble. It's tough. The cares of this world are many. That's why God gave us the church. That's why God gave us each other, a community of believers who can share life together, who can share burdens together. And I believe that's one of the purposes of the church is to provide support and encouragement for believers on this side of eternity. I want you to take a look at this illustration that I took from the book Total Church. Um, many people, if not most people, view church as just an, another part of life that must be balanced or juggled along with everything else they have to do in life. Somehow, we have to juggle work, marriage, kids, home repair, studies, and everything else, including the church. But what happens when life starts getting a little crazy or maybe somebody throws in an extra ball into that whole mess that you're juggling. Well, you drop one, maybe more than one. And sadly, in this scenario, church is often the easiest ball to drop. Because no one's forcing you to do it. It's not, your, your income isn't depending on whether you show up at church on Sunday morning or not. Whether you, whether you commit yourself to the life of the church. And oftentimes... There's this thing that, that, when we, that when we withhold ourselves, we don't necessarily even notice the effects right away. They're subtle. But maybe there's another way. In this picture, the community of the church, with you included, forms the hub of a wheel where everything else in your life that you need to somehow balance is brought into alignment because of the support you have as a member of the church. When life starts to feel out of control, those within the church who are close to you can stand with you and help you make sense of your situation and to pr prioritize your life according to God's word. That's not to say that life isn't gonna get difficult and things aren't gonna get crazy, but it's to say that when it does, you're not alone in dealing with the craziness. When you let other people into your life, when you let the church into your life, the God-given community, they were designed to stand next to you and to walk with you through the craziness. So often, we try to, uh, we try to force discipleship into a pretty small box. We say that discipleship is meeting together for one hour a week to discuss one chapter out of a spiritual book. Or in order for discipleship to be effective, you have to follow this method or, or use this program. 
And those things are good. There's nothing wrong with that. But wouldn't it be awesome if when new believers show up here at Wellspring and everyone that came in contact with them on a Sunday morning was discipling them in some way and they didn't even know it. See, I don't think the church in Acts had a program. They certainly didn't have the latest John Piper book. But I do think they were constantly engaging in discipleship. Our vision uh, here at Wellspring Bible Fellowship for how we carry on the mission of Christ is to intentionally influence every relationship with the gospel, both inside the church and outside. Is that not discipleship? So I'd like to leave you with a challenge this morning. And I may have borrowed part of this from Stan's sermon last week. So, Stan, you get the credit wherever you are. Would you consider throwing yourself wholeheartedly into the life of the church? And when I say throwing yourself wholeheartedly into the life of the church, I don't mean that you immediately go out and you sign up for every program that you can possibly be a part of, that you volunteer to be here every day that the doors are open. That's not what I mean. I don't, I don't want to add busyness to your life. What I mean is, would you consider allowing yourself to be known by the church? Would you consider putting in the time and effort that it takes to truly get to know someone else within the church. Spend some time asking the Lord this week to reveal the barriers in your life to doing so. Um, as we've been going through this series on Multiply, we've really, um, we've really emphasized getting involved in a home group. Um, we've really tried to ramp up that ministry in order to be able to do this because um, we believe that while there's a lot of great community and stuff that happens every Sunday morning, we believe that really good community also happens in homes week to week, gathering together, just like it talks about in Acts. There's, a, there's an intimacy that happens there when, you, when you're invited into somebody's home and you experience their hospitality and you have... Uh, you, you know, you're not bound by, okay, we got to be out of here by 1130 because lunch is coming up and, you know, you just, you gather together for a meeting and you spend time with one another. And it's in that atmosphere that you can, that you can step out and you can share your life with other believers and allow them to share their lives with you. And so I hope if you, if you haven't gotten involved in a home group yet, it's not too late. We're a few weeks into this series, but it doesn't matter. Join a life group. I'm sorry, a home group. <laughs> Where you can share life together. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, we've, been, we've been having this difficulty over determining what to call these groups because we had a couple different names and it got confusing. And so we're still, as staff, we're working on remembering we're, we're calling it home groups. Let's avoid the confusion. So if you're not a part of a home group, I would just, um, I would encourage you to think about it, um, where, where you can go and you can, you can wrestle with these concepts with other believers who are wrestling with them themselves. So I'm not saying that it won't be difficult at times. I'm not saying you'll never get hurt. We're sinners. We hurt people. But what I can tell you is this. When you experience life within a church that looks like this, you will never be the same. Any hurt that you might sustain at the hands of the church will be far outweighed by the blessing that you experience from giving yourself to the church of Jesus Christ, to, to being a part of his body, to, to loving his people. Would you consider doing that? Let's pray.
Lord, I thank you for giving us each other. I thank you for the way that you have worked in my life and the lives of so many other people through the ministry of the church. Lord, you have, you have equipped us. You have built us up. You have given us of your Holy Spirit. You have given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And a major part of that is your church. And so I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would be breaking down barriers. It's so hard sometimes to give of ourselves to one another. And yet I I pray, Lord, that you would help Wellspring Bible Fellowship to experience a redemptive community like nothing else, like we haven't experienced before, that you would build us up as a body together for your glory, for the good of your people, and for, the, and for the good of Roseburg, Lord. Lord, make us a church that you want us to be. Do your work, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.